In this episode, we're going to be exploring the Horti, the garden villa estates of Imperial Rome. They formed a green belt around the entire city. It's something that we forget about that they once existed through an examination of archeological sites and numerous works of art in Rome's museums. Let's recreate the Horti, the garden estates of Imperial Rome. The Horti were villa estates in Rome that formed a sort of green belt around the city. Starting the Republican period, it was initially a who's who of Rome who had these garden estates, Pompey, Julius Caesar, and we can start off with Lucullus. He is a statesman in the 80s and a general who then retired and he initiated, kicked off the fashion of building luxurious garden palaces. And his estate was on the Pincho Hill overlooking the Campus Martius. And this was a place known for pleasure. It was a place known for dining. It was a place known for luxuriousness. And ultimately, this becomes a property of the Emperor Claudius. His Empress Messalina lives here. And ultimately, it was the site of her murder in AD 48. Let's take a look in Trastevere at the Horti Kaisers. Julius Caesar built a large estate in Trastevere area, Trans Tiberium, by the train station. And it was a place known for luxuriousness. And he lived there in part with Cleopatra, right up until when he was assassinated on the Ides of March in 44 BC. He had another property, another Horti Kaisers, on the Quirinal Hill that ultimately becomes the property of Sallust, the historian, who became fabulously wealthy as being a governor. And he built something that became legendary, the Horti Celestiani, eventually passed into the possession of the imperial family under Claudius. And it is a place that's frequented by many emperors. The emperor really in particular liked it. Here's a structure that's built by Hadrian. And you can see a great disparity between the ground level of today and this structure from the second century AD, it was once in a large valley that's artificially filled. But what is found in archeological excavations is the Ludovisi collection. Things like the Ludovisi throne, which is today in Palazzo Altamps. We have extraordinary works of art, like these figures. That's the product of the artist Menelaus, who has signed this extraordinary work of art again in Palazzo Altamps. So with these incredible works of art, we have an opportunity to get a sense of the decoration of these large estates with plenty of landscaped gardens. Here's the famous Suicide Gaul, and here is the Dying Gaul, today in the Capitoline Museums. Extraordinary works of art came from the Gardens of Sallust that was an imperial possession for centuries. Let's take a look now at the Horti Lamiani. Lucius Aelius Lamia was a Roman senator who held a number of offices in the reigns of Augustus and Tiberius. After his death, the property became that of Tiberius, and afterwards it was acquired by Caligula. We can see parts of it in the new museum, the Museo Ninfeo, which is in Palazzo Vittorio. But more impressively, we can see the artwork, which is in the Capitoline Museums and in Monte Martini. Absolutely breathtaking marble, statuary, and of course, so many different examples of the refined decoration, gilded bronze, we have jewels, and truly, it's this kind of decoration, just in bits and pieces and fragments, that underlines the extraordinary wealth that was part of the allure and the majesty of the Horti Garden Estates. And we get a really good sense of it with all of these refined details. And it helps us reconstruct what life was like in the residences in these garden estates that principally were on the hills overlooking the Campus Martius area, but also in the Trastevere area. Okay, let's now take a look at the Horti of Mycenaeus. Now, this is the only real structure that we can visit today. It's known as the Auditorium of Mycenaeus, but it is giving us a sense of a place of banqueting. It's a place of spectacle. It's a place of leisure, and it is dating to the time of Mycenaeus, and it's then restored thereafter. 
And of course, we have lots of statuary that's found in the vicinity, such as this magnificent hunting dog and many statues. Again, they are located today in the Capitoline Museums, underlining once again the amount of wealth that is spent to decorate landscape settings as well as interior spaces of several pavilions for the emperor and his guests. It wasn't just the imperial members that had Horti and the senator class. Here we have two examples of freedmen properties. We have the Horti Palantiani and the Horti Epaphroditiani. And these are wealthy freedmen, Pallas under Claudius and Epaphroditus under Nero. And it's afterwards that their properties are acquired and become residential holdings of the imperial family. What can we see from these properties? Well, we can't see their properties of the freedmen, but we can see what comes to be built on the site afterwards. The so-called Temple of Minerva Medica. This actually dates the time of Constantine and shows you just how impressive the imperial residences are becoming in the early 4th century. This is an extraordinary heated hall and it's part of an extensive palace that goes all the way and connects to Caesorium which is another villa estate known as the Horti Variani. It's dating to the time of Elagabalus. And what can we see from this residence? Well, we can see a number of residential spaces, rooms that are associated with that extensive palace. It gets its start in the time of Septimius Severus and really comes into its own under Elagabalus and thereafter in the family of Constantine. The construction of the Horti Veriani was disrupted by the construction of the Aurelianic walls. But originally what you have is a circus, a large hall which becomes Santa Croce di Gerusalem, and you even have a private amphitheater incorporated into the Aurelianic wall. Let's go back to Tristevere and take a look at a few more garden estates. We have the Horti Geta, which is referring to Geta, the younger son of Septimia Severus, right along the Tiber River. There was the Horti Domitiae, which would be the gardens of Domitia, the wife of Domitian, and actually included the property of the mausoleum of Hadrian. And then finally, we have the Horti of Agrippina, the mother of Nero, that it becomes, of course, the property of Nero. And we have ancient sources like Tacitus that say there was a private theater on that estate where Nero would practice before performing publicly. And recently, there has been discovered the remains of the private theater right by the Vatican, underlining the fact that there's still so much more of the garden estates that will be discovered in the future. Now, in the center of Rome, the Campus Martius, there are still other horti. We have the horti of Agrippa that's tied to the baths of Agrippa that he wills to the people after he dies in 12 BC. And we have the horti of Pompey. We're not exactly sure where they were, but they became the property of Mark Antony after Pompey's death. And the name was perpetuated. It was probably on the slopes of the Pincho, close to the Campus Martius. Thanks for exploring the Horti Villas of Imperial Rome with us. Thanks for subscribing. And please take a look at our courses and join us in person in Rome and throughout the empire. And this video was brought to you by a grant from the CAAS Marcantonio Award.